This morning we, we continue our series in the Idols and Icons of Christmas, and today we talk about the gift, and then of course the wise men. And the reading comes from the second chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 12. Let us listen together for God's Word. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they, heard the, when they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, as we open Your Word this morning, we long to hear Your voice, and we pray that by the power of Your Spirit, You would speak to us. May we hear this good news of great joy that is for all the people. In Jesus' name, Amen. It's the time of year for giving gifts. It's also the time of year for gift-giving dilemmas. Have you ever experienced these? Not knowing exactly how to respond to a gift or perhaps what sort of gift to give in a certain situation. Good news, the website is Giftypedia. And no, I'm not making this up. This website actually exists and it is there to answer all of your gift-giving challenges this holiday season. For instance, it gives you uh, help with subjects like when you should give a gift, is it okay to give a gift card, frugal gifts for frugal people, when and how to decline a gift, gifts for clergy, I've printed that one out, you can pick up slips on the way out, (laughs) gifts for co-workers, the etiquette of re-gifting, and my personal favorite, what not to buy your girlfriend. All of these at giftypedia.com. It also gives some information about different international gift-giving customs. For instance, in China, it's it's proper to refuse a gift three times before you accept it. And of course, this is a mutual exchange where the giver of the gift would would, uh, insist three times that the person accept the gift. And this is how gift-giving is done. In Arab cultures, it's, it's proper to receive the gift with the right hand. It would be taken as an offense if the gift were received with the left hand. In Japan, a gift is received with both hands. In America, you ask for a gift receipt and then you consult Giftopedia to figure out what to do next. (coughs) The giving and receiving of gifts dominates the Christmas holiday. There is no getting around it, especially this time of year. The women are probably sitting back thinking, well, I'm done. Or the men are thinking, when is the service going to be over? I, I have errands to run. The retail economy of our country is really built around the Christmas season. This is the season that sustains so many retailers throughout the entire year. They, they do so much business in such a short period of time. And so the earlier the Christmas season starts, the more lucrative the season is for them, which is why in September and October we start to see signs of Christmas creeping into stores. And, and this, this tradition um, does not go back to the wise men. I'm sorry to say... Uh, we do not give gifts at Christmas time because the wise men brought gifts to Jesus. We do not give, give, give gifts to each other at Christmas time because it's Jesus' birthday. In fact, we give gifts at Christmas time because it used to be common practice to give gifts at New Year's. This would be uh, 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 in, in at least 
the last couple hundred years in America, people would travel around to their friends' and neighbors' homes and visit them on New Year's Day and bring gifts. And we've talked a little bit in previous sermons about how the Christmas celebration once upon a time was a, was a, a wild night of drunken reveling out in the streets. And, and in the 19th century in the United States, people began to see that as a real problem. So the celebration of Christmas transitioned into the home. The Christmas tree formed the center of that celebration, and the giving of gifts um, was moved from New Year's into Christmas. So that is where the tradition began, and, and so calling, you know, doing it in, in uh, thinking about it as related to the wise men or Jesus' birthday, really what we're doing is we're, we're, we're putting kind of a layer of religious meaning over something that originally didn't have that same religious meaning, which is good. It's a wonderful thing. It's important for us to find new points of connection throughout the Christmas season to discover ways to make the season more meaningful for us. But we also run the risk of uh, preventing ourselves from being able to be critical of this aspect of the holiday season. Because it is no secret to anyone here that Christmas is, is over-commercialized, that Christmas is, is too dominated by the giving and receiving of gifts. It is too dominated by the, the, the economy, the, 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 the advertising, the shopping, and the spending, and all of this is, is too much a part of the holiday season. And so it's important for us to recognize that, that, that the, the, the commercialization of Christmas can prevent us from seeing what Christmas really means. And so of all the so-called idols of this sermon series, I think that this one, the gift, is, is probably the one that is most likely to distract us from the meaning of Christmas, the one that is most likely to take our focus away from what we are really celebrating this Christmas. And I think that somewhere in all of this, in the midst of all of the chaos and the frenzy of giving gifts at Christmas time, we have lost, or at the very least, we have cheapened the meaning of a gift. The meaning of a gift. What is a gift in the first place? What does it mean to give something to someone else, or of course, to receive something? So to kind of explore what a gift means, I want you to go along with me here for a little thought exercise uh, about Sue and Sally. I've changed their names to protect the innocent. Um, so Sue gives a gift. We'll call it X to Sally. So Sue gives X to Sally freely and graciously with the best intentions. And Sally, of course, responds with gratitude. So far, so good. Sally also makes a mental note, as most of us would, to repay the gift in a discreet and timely way, something that demonstrates her gratitude for the gift. And so what we have in effect is that Sue's gift of X to Sally has moved Sally to give Y, another gift, to Sue. And Y is, of course, of comparable value to X, so if it was too little, it might, it might uh, offend and if it was too expensive, it might humiliate. So there's a balance there. What we find here is that as soon as a gift is given, it begins to annul itself. It begins to cancel itself out. Because in receiving a gift, Sally has also received a sense of indebtedness. And in giving a gift, Sue has also added to her reputation for generosity. Sue wins and Sally loses. Sue comes out on top because her reputation is better, and Sally loses because she is now in debt, and a debt that she has to repay, which is exactly the opposite of what Sue intended in the first place, giving that gift freely and graciously. So Sally, of course, sets out to restore equilibrium. Are you with me so far? <laughs> Does this sound familiar? Yes. An act of giving has turned into an, an economy an exchange in which the scales have to be balanced. And so you might say, what if Sue gives Sally the gift anonymously? Well, that actually makes matters worse because then Sally has no ability to discharge this debt that she's been given. And Sue congratulates herself even more for the nobility of her generosity, not needing to be given credit for the gift. What if Sally's response to the gift were simply cold ingratitude? Well, that's worse still, because then Sue congratulates herself even more. Giving a gift 
sets in motion a kind of economy. This is a little bit of a caricature, but I, I hope that you sense the reality that, that, that lies behind this, that I'm sure that you have all experienced this give and take, this exchange of gifts, this economy that is, is uh, at work when we give gifts. It's not all that much unlike the Chinese tradition of, of uh, offering three times, refusing three times. It's a kind of a dance that we do that surrounds this act of giving gifts. And so to a certain extent, when a gift is given, as soon as it is given, it starts to cancel itself out because it sets in motion this circle, this economy that is almost impossible to escape. And so in one manner of thinking about it, the only gift that can truly be called a gift is a gift that the giver doesn't know she's giving and a gift that the receiver doesn't know she's receiving. It's a kind of crazy version of Secret Santa. And, and so we are left with the question, is a gift, is a real, honest, true gift even possible? And if it is, what is it? Because every gift that we give is suspect. Every gift that we give is suspect. We are all too prone to give for the wrong motives or, it, or not even to know the motives behind the gifts that we give. And it's important for us to recognize not just our own motives or our own ignorance of our motives, but also what gets set in motion when we give a gift. And that perhaps for us there is no such thing as a gift freely given. So what then does a true gift look like? Where are we left? How about this? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. We're fast forwarding here to Good Friday, these words of Jesus on the cross to the, about the Roman soldiers who are crucifying him. God's forgiveness is a perfect example of a gift, of a true gift. Now, unfortunately, over the centuries, the church has even made forgiveness into a kind of economy, requiring certain things in order to be forgiven, like an expression of sorrow, an intention to make amends, a promise not to repeat the offense, a willingness to do penance. And after those, those steps have been taken, after all those boxes have been checked, then... Then, then forgiveness is possible. And what you have instead is that a person has earned forgiveness in the same way that, that a bank might say that a loan is forgiven. Banks don't forgive. Banks don't give gifts unless they're up to something. If your loan is forgiven, it's because you've met all the obligations. You have paid all the debts. You have earned that forgiveness. And how can we call that forgiveness? Forgiveness that is earned is not forgiveness at all. And so... True forgiveness, the real gift of forgiveness, is undeserved, uncalled for, unasked for. It is freely given. It is an expenditure without return. And so, in the same way, love becomes uh, real love. It, it finds its fullest expression, as Jesus tells us, when it is extended to an enemy. Jesus says, what good is it to love those who already love you? Even, even the, the Pharisees and tax collectors do that. One writer says, even the mafia do that. What good is it to invite to your home those who can invite you back and repay you, but instead invite those who can't? Invite those who can't repay you. Give to those who can't pay you back. This, according to Jesus, is the fullest expression of love. This is the, the, the truest nature of a gift. The forgiveness of the unforgivable. And so we come back then full circle to the Magi, to the gift that they offered. The Magi come out of nowhere. They're these mysterious men from the East. We don't know where they came from. We don't really know anything about them. We can only guess. And they come to this obscure family. This family, this poor peasant family. And they bring to this family kingly gifts, and then they disappear again, never to re-enter the narrative. They didn't hang around until Matthew started writing his gospel to be sure that they got all the details right, that their story was recorded properly. They did what they came to do. And what they came to do, what their purpose was, 
was to honor Jesus, to pay him homage, to honor Jesus. That was it. That was their purpose for traveling hundreds, perhaps thousands of miles. That was their purpose for bringing these rich, expensive gifts to a newborn baby boy who had no use for them. This was their purpose, to give him honor. This is the season of gift giving. This is the time of year that we, by default, become obsessed with giving and receiving gifts because we have no choice. We have to get a present for so-and-so, and we have to do this for so-and-so, and and so-and-so did this for us, and we really really ought to do something, and boy, time is running out. Christmas is just two days away. And did we get this in the mail on time? Will it get there? We all know that it's a chaotic season, and we all participate in it, myself included. I'm not exempt from it by any means. I uh, you know, we, we do the, the whole nine yards, and, and looking back on it, it's fun. It's kind of what marks the season for us. But at the same time, it, it can cause us to lose our focus, to lose our focus on what a gift really is. How do we give? How do we give in a way that reflects the way that God has given to us? Because I think that at Christmas time and any other time, that is how we honor Jesus. That is how we give honor to Jesus. And I'm not obviously just talking about presents that are wrapped in paper and a bow. How do we forgive in a way that reflects the way that God has forgiven us? Do we forgive those who have earned it? Do we forgive those who deserve it? Or do we forgive without expecting anything in return? Do we give not expecting anything, any kind of recognition for our gift? Do we give with the kind of generosity that reflects the generosity that God has shown to us in loving us? This is the good news of the Gospel, that God already loves you, that God already forgives you. This is the good news that we recognize when we baptize an infant who has no clue what's going on, that God already loves that child. God has already forgiven that child because that work was done in Christ. That work was done long ago. And so we are called then to give in that same way. And our giving will always be suspect. Our giving will always be tinged with that kind of economy, that give and take, because let's face it, we're still people. We still crave recognition. We still crave status. These things about us, they'll never change. We might improve them little bits along the way. We can only try, and our gifts will always be suspect. But the more that we recognize that, and the more we recognize how much God has given to us, how much God has forgiven us, the freer we will be to give. To give freely. and To give graciously. Because at the heart of the idea of a gift is grace. A gift freely given. And grace is the Greek word for gift. God's gift to us. Let us pray. God, we thank You for Your grace. We thank You for the gift of Your Son. The gift that has set us free from the things of this world that try to trap us. The economies. The give and take. The exchanges. The balanced scales. You have set us free from all of this. Set us free to give of ourselves without expecting return. Set us free to live lives of faithfulness without expecting dramatic results. You've set us free to be your children, loved and chosen. And that is all. And we thank you. Amen.